Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning, class sir. once again. Um, so, today's class is on uh, the sweet span of Avon, Shakespeare. Okay. So, that's going to be an introduction to Shakespeare. Then we will look at uh, some of his uh, sonnets. Fine. So, this is today's class, the sweet span of Avon. So what we are going to do, part one, Shakespeare, a biography. It comes under unit five. Then that's a kind of an interlude, sonnet, an introduction. Then part two, we will again continue with the Shakespeare, Shakespeare in sonnets, kind of an overview. Okay. So this is today's class. So let's begin. So what you can expect? It's a kind of a, an overview of Shakespeare's biography. When he was born, then I will take you through his career. Okay, so Shakespeare, a biography, unit five. What's in a name? As uh, Juliet said, see Shakespeare signed his name differently. In his own lifetime, he signed his own name in different ways. Uh, William Shakespeare, look at the spelling, S-H-A-K-S-P-E-A-R-E, or -E E-S-P-E, then S-P-E-R-E, then S-P-E-R-E, you know, uh, you know, William, you know, on the other side, you have William, B-I-L-L-M, B-I-L-L-M, B-M, S-H-A-K-S-P-E, a lot of spellings. And we discussed this earlier, uh, um, the same concept, uh, variant spellings, when we discussed spelling reform in the English language, especially during the early modern period, 1700s, right? So a similar thing is happening, but the curious thing is, the spelling William Shakespeare, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, William, S-H-A-K-E-S-P-E-A-R-E. This is the spelling we use now, but this was the spelling he didn't use in his own lifetime. I got this piece of information from Bill Bryson uh, and his famous book, Shakespeare. So throughout this lecture, I mean, Shakespeare's biography, I would be using a lot of quotes from this book, which influenced me a lot. I'm also... Um, using uh, various other sources to, for this lecture. Okay. And I also interestingly came across uh, Sigmund Freud's support to the idea that the name Shakespeare, you know, the name Shakespeare was actually a derivation, a French derivation. That was, I mean, that was not his original idea. She, you know, Sigmund Freud, the Austrian psychoanalyst, supported this idea that Shakespeare might have come from the French name, Jack Pierre. So Jack Peer might have turned into Shakespeare. So he supported that idea. It was a curious idea, but it sounds okay. Okay, we may not know. Um, because there is a connection between you know, French names and English names. Uh, even for instance, uh, Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, who is uh, considered the father of English literature. Even his name, Chaucer comes from French. Uh, Sashur or Sorcher, you know, kind of a shoe in French. C H A U S S U R E. So that means uh, shoe in French. Uh, who knows? Uh, the word Chaser might have, uh, the family name might have come from, or the, they have some kind of an ancestry, uh, kind of a cobblers. We may not know. Right? So this is one idea. It's a curious idea. And Sigmund Freud went with that. Okay, this is the name. Name itself is a disputed one. Everything concerning this writer, uh, there is some mystery to it and there is some curiosity to it. So today's class is all about this guy, William Shakespeare. <laughs> Next. And his friend and fellow uh, playwright, Ben Johnson called Shakespeare the sweet span of Avon. And why? Because the, the place he was born, Shakespeare's birthplace is uh, Stratford upon Avon, Warwickshire in England. And there is a river called the Avon. And there are a lot of, uh, there were a lot of swans on that river. And the one river that shone and flew to London was uh, Shakespeare. So the sweet swan of Avon. And the sweetness refers to uh, the music or the song let out by the swan, especially at the end of its life. There is a myth to it, a uh, uh, myth about it. Uh, we will discuss that at the end of the end of this class. So the sweet swan of Avon. 
and there was also a playhouse called the span so here is a stamp uh, representing that uh, uh, the theater the span uh, started in uh, 1595 so you you see the river there avon and on the banks of this river we have a playhouse called the span okay so this is the sweet swan of avon and he was born as all of you know 23rd april 1564 uh, st george's day and you you might also know that he uh, he died on the same date 23rd april and bill bryson when i read this book uh, he made this interesting observation that there was a plague at that time when shakespeare was born 1564 there was a plague uh, like you know like this epidemic now or pandemic now so during that plague many died even uh, the neighbor the neighbor of uh, shakespeare's you know uh, they lost four children and because of this uh, bill bryson uh, writes in a sense william shakespeare's greatest achievement in life was not writing hamlet or the sonnets but just surviving his first year as a baby boy um, you know who, who else if the plague had took shakespeare's life then there, there was no shakespeare okay and another interesting observation by bill bryson because shakespeare was born under the old julian calendar so if you if we make some calculation because we are following a different cal calendar now gregorian so he concluded that today that date might be may 3rd so shakespeare we should be celebrating shakespeare's birthday on may 3rd now but anyway we are going with that one uh, the old calendar so when it comes to his name even on the date of his birth or the celebration of his birthday there is a dispute but uh, he has come to a logical conclusion that uh, now if you are following gregorian calendar we should be celebrating shakespeare's birthday on 3rd may anyway we are still following 23rd april okay so this is his birth next when it comes to shakespeare's schooling uh, ben johnson made uh, this statement uh, again uh, small latin i mean shakespeare had small latin and less greek that's his statement and he went to king's new school uh, you can see the modern i mean or the restorated one the school uh, in church street it it was a grammar school a local grammar school in the guy street of uh, in church uh, in church street sorry hall in church street again uh, uh, byron says see something's wrong with that statement small latin less greek he he argues that shakespeare had a great deal of latin in his life because as a school boy going you know a boy going to a grammar school at the boy should you know learn or cramp or mug up latin or else he couldn't survive there so definitely shakespeare might have mugged up or learned a lot of uh, latin grammar there so small latin uh, and less greek may not be so true uh, that was uh, byron's i say bryson's argument and mother and father mother uh, mary orton you are orton uh, you also have a famous uh, book series orton shakespeare e r d n orton shakespeare then we have uh, his father john shakespeare was actually a glover g l o v e r uh, or whichever i mean w h i t t a w r that means someone who works you know uh, with leather white or soft leather and it at that time it was an respectable uh, a respectable uh, trade okay. so we have the father and the mother next we go for the better half uh, shakespeare's wife uh, anne hathaway uh, 1556 1623 um in her father's will uh, a name uh, a you know was uh, pronounced or written a g n e s and pronounced n s uh, silent g n s so an interesting thing um 
I think Shakespeare was at that time uh, the Sachin Tendulkar of India, of the Sachin Tendulkar of cricket. So Shakespeare was uh, the dramatist there. Of course, they ha they have uh, a lot of commonalities. The Sachin Tendulkar of uh, cricket in India and the Shakespeare of uh, Elizabethan England. Uh, both were successful in that field and both married an, an elderly girl. So Shakespeare married uh, Hathaway uh, in 1582. Shakespeare was 18 and she was 26. Eight years, eight years uh, senior to Shakespeare. And again, spelling. On their marriage bond, Shakespeare's name is rendered as uh, Shakespeare. That is some meaning to it. Shame. Anyway, uh, Shakespeare. And Anna Hathaway, she died in uh, 1623 at the age of 67, and she outlived Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare died earlier, I mean, before uh, her. So almost, um, she outlived our, around uh, seven years, right? So she outlived Shakespeare, and um, uh, they, had, they had a few stories. You know, people have been trying to write uh, the biography of Anne Hathaway. People have been trying to write uh, Shakespeare's full biography. Similar way, people have been trying to write Anne Hathaway's biography. Especially some uh, feminist, they want to recover this uh, biography. They are more interested in Anne Hathaway and her genius than in uh, Shakespeare. And we will look at all these things uh, later point of time. Okay, now we move on to the next one. Children, they had three children. Uh, Susanna was the first one. Uh, Susanna was born in uh, May 1583. And here is a portrait, I think, of German origin. So you, you see Shakespeare speaking to Anna Hathaway, and there's a dog, and there are three children, two daughters, and a son. And the next uh, twins, Judith and Hamlet. Uh, you might have easily guessed now. Hamlet, Hamlet might have had some influence on his play, Hamlet. So he had a son, Hamlet, and both were born in uh, February 1585. Unfortunately, Hamlet died of, uh, we don't know, maybe plague or some other uh, causes unknown. Um, 1596, age 11, right? This is another factor. Uh, it might have disturbed uh, uh, Shakespeare, so he might have uh, come up with uh, Hamlet we don't know, but people uh, uh, drew parallels between Hamlet, the son, the son of Shakespeare, and and the brainchild, uh, Hamlet, Shakespeare's uh, brainchild, uh, Hamlet. So kind of a biographical touch or biographical uh, appreciation of the play. Even Freud went with that, as you know, Oedipal complex. Okay. So when it comes to the Shakespeare line, you know, the family, uh, Judith, uh, she loved, uh, sorry, she lived uh, till 1882 and died uh, later, uh, aged 77. She had three children, including a son named Shakespeare, but all predeceased her, died before uh, Judith. And she died uh, without any children, without any issue. Issue here refers to children. Next to Susanna, uh, she lived till uh, 1649 and died uh, aged 66. She had a daughter, uh, uh, Shakespeare's uh, granddaughter, Elizabeth. Uh, again, she lived uh, till 1670 and she married twice, had no children uh, with her, you know, with Elizabeth. With Elizabeth, uh, the Shakespeare line came to an end. We no longer have uh, the Shakespeare family. The, the line is broken over, came to an end. Okay. So simply put, Anna Hathaway, wife, three children, uh, Susanna, Judith, then you have uh, Hamnet and Elizabeth, granddaughter. Everything came to an end uh, in the 1700s itself. And only is writing. Writing survived Shakespeare and Shakespeare or uh, Anna Hathaway, all the other people, they, they still remember them because of this uh, writing. Then there is this uh, curious year called the last years of Shakespeare. Now, after the birth of the twins, Judith and Hamnet, there is a huge gap in Shakespeare's life, Shakespeare's biography. So between 1585 and 1592, we have no documentary evidence of his life. What really happened between these years? 
Where was Shakespeare? What was he doing? So was he in London? We don't know. What was he doing if not in London? Or what was he doing in his hometown? So we have no record of uh, you know, his life during this period. So the between, I mean, 1585, baptism of his twins, Judith and Hamlet, and 92, his arrival on the London theater scene. So between this, what happened? So there are a lot of stories we don't know. And there's a curious story by one of his, uh, you know, one of his editors in a sense, uh, editor of his uh, works, Nicholas Rowe. He said, Shakespeare was caught poaching deer uh, from the estate of uh, Sir Tom's uh, Lucy at, uh, uh, Charlotte thought. So what happened? Uh, this is the story. He said uh, Shakespeare was actually a, a, a deer hunter. Uh, he went to this estate and he stole uh, a killed a deer and he was caught red-handed and he was supposed to be punished for stealing uh, deer poaching. Uh, it's a beautiful story. I don't know how Nicholas uh, Rowe came up with this story, but it, it, it looks interesting. The story looks interesting. So he was caught Know, a poacher. And in order to escape punishment for this crime he committed, he might have ran away, uh, uh, ran away from Stratford and reached London. So he might have banded around uh, with the, maybe with some uh, uh, theater troops. Um, and he might have finally reached London. And that maybe he was in hiding. He might have practiced or he might have been a helper. Uh, in the theater scene, then he might have emerged as a, a playwright. We may not know. But this is one hell of a story written by uh, Nicholas Rowe. And this story caught many people's imagination. And uh, people sometimes accept you know, something, something uh, that decorates the Shakespeare's biography. Okay? We may not know the authenticity of this uh, uh, story, kind of an apocryphal one. But OK, Shakespeare was a dear poacher and he was caught and he was supposed to be punished but he escaped the punishment by running away uh, to London. Okay, this is a good story. So lost years refers to this period. They tried to, it's a kind of a black period in Shakespeare's biography. People try to fill it out. And one story is by Nicholas Rowe. What really happened during that year? Okay. Then, as I told you before, 1592 is important. See, we have no documentary evidence between these two periods. I mean, between this, during this period. But 1592, 85, we have a document, the baptism, the twins baptism certificate. And 1592, we have an important document that Shakespeare was in London. And the document was by the University of Wit, uh, Robert Greene. In a way, it's actually a demeaning one. I mean, he wrote this uh, scathing uh, uh, a pamphlet, Goat's Worth of Wit, referring to Shakespeare, uh, 1592. So this is an important piece of document when it comes to Shakespeare's biography, without which we may not understand um, the gap. Uh, that's why at least for that, we should uh, thank uh, Robert Greene for uh, for taking Shakespeare to task and um, reprimanding him. So this was the pamphlet, uh, Grot's Oath of Wit. What is Grot? Grot refers to a coin, you know, a coin of uh, little value, money, you know. So he kind of a brain, he's comparing Shakespeare's brain with that coin of little value. So Grot's Oath of Wit. And that's a concept of kind because they were uh, you know, stupid. So here is a guy from the countryside, Avon, in a Stratford. And now he's actually rocking in London. So Robert Greene was, uh, was in his deadbed. He's go, he was about to die. At his deadbed, you know, in his deadbed, you know, he wrote this pamphlet. And even one who published this pamphlet uh, later apologized for publishing this. But anyway, the famous one, he called Shakespeare an abstract crow, you know, which uh, cannot sing like a swan. So kind of, a, not a swan, but a crow. So that was the comparison. And this is an important uh, passage from the pamphlet. 
and upstart grow upstart in the sense um, very very arrogant uh, prideful and upstart grow beautify with our wings in the sense uh, he is accusing uh, robert green is accusing shakespeare of plagiarism shakespeare stole many things from unus tubits and others that's what uh, robert green is claiming in a way it's true but he came out with something else like uh, ts eliot said a true poet is someone who is able to steal only poor poets imitate genius they steal and shakespeare stole simple right so beautified with our wings so he was not original so that is accusation that with his uh, tiger's heart wrapped in a player's height so he, uh, he was alluding to shakespeare's play henry 6 uh, part 3 supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you so he was not good at you know the kind of a scholarly writing he went for blank verse you know not uh, uh, some other uh, verse is steeped in history right so he, he was going for common audience so he was reaching out to common audience with the blank words at the same time he was sticking with elite and being an absolute jonas factotum that means jack of all trade uh, shakespeare was good at you know uh, he was jealous you know the most of the university students they were jealous of shakespeare simple but because shakespeare was a poet shakespeare was a playwright shakespeare was an actor he also owned shares in theaters so he was successful and he put on plays for queen elizabeth 1 and for uh, james 1 he was you know an all rounder like uh, hamlet uh, sorry uh, hamlet or sachin tendulkar so kind of an all rounder you know uh, sachin tendulkar was able to bowl then a good fielder a captain and a hitter similar way here is a guy shakespeare uh, jack of uh, all trades a uh, poet a playwright an actor uh, you know script writer he can do anything so an absolute jack you know john factotum is in his own conceit the only shit scene in a country so it's a kind of mocking see this guy is of uh, of a little value in a grots worth of wit came from a countryside because these people were university wits oh my god so this guy came actually he shook the entire scene the theater scene shakespeare shook the entire theater scene uh, uh, in london so maybe this pamphlet registered uh, the mood or uh, the fame of shakespeare that's why this piece uh, 1592 is an important piece of evidence or uh, uh, a document to understand shakespeare's life or shakespeare's biography as i told you before an actor as an actor you know shakespeare uh, uh played a lot of roles and uh byron right and a prize and rights and of course uh, there were documents that shakespeare acted throughout his professional life in minor roles not you know huge roles because he had to write plays he had to direct uh, he had to attend to a lot of other things so throughout uh, his life we have documents like 1592 we have a document grots worth of wit by green then 1598 1603 1608 we have a lot of documents saying that shakespeare acted as a professional actor but minor roles so according to tradition there is uh, this belief that shakespeare might have played uh, you know uh, minor roles like the ghost in hamlet so the ghost comes and reminds hamlet remember me so hamlet says father i will remember you i take revenge but he takes a lot of time maybe uh, we also discussed hamlet hamlet so that kind of a connection maybe so in his own play i mean if it is a, a biographical touch uh, kind of an autobiographical one uh, shakespeare might have wanted to act in this play as a father the, uh, the ghost we may not know okay then uh, this is uh, this everybody acknowledges that uh, shakespeare actor uh, as a performer you know uh, he was in his friend ben johnson's every man in his humor and sejanus this fall so we have another document 1598 and 1603 and also 1608 i don't know what the document refers to so yes that that should you know 
you know, Swift should be jealous of uh, Shakespeare, but they were envious of Shakespeare, uh, especially Robert Greene. Next, uh, there was this tavern called Mermaid Tavern. Uh, even uh, John Keats wrote a poem on this tavern, John Keats. So here is a tavern, kind of an informal meetings uh, uh, where uh, the intellectuals, the Elizabethan intellectuals gathered and they discussed. We have Shakespeare in the middle. We will discuss you know, the cloth he's wearing. He was wearing in a black. What, why was he, you know, even there, there are a few guys wearing black. Why black cloth? Uh, Bryson gives a lot of explanations and uh, interesting explanation why Shakespeare, you know, there was also a portrait where Shakespeare was seen wearing black. And what's the importance of Shakespeare's wearing the black uh, suit? You. Okay, we will discuss that in a later point of time. But anyway, uh, uh, yes, please, others put it on mute. Okay, so here, 1603, Bro, we have some, uh, please put it on mute. Okay, 1603, so we have this informal group, and uh, you know. The literary figures, the famous literary figures associated with this tavern, you have Ben Johnson and Francis uh, Beaumont, you have uh, playwrights. Sir Walter Raleigh and Shakespeare were set. Okay, they might have also attended this meeting, but we do not have enough evidence. But Ben Johnson was there, maybe Shakespeare might have been there. Okay, so we don't know. But anyway, this is a Mermaid Tavern. We have uh, a picture. Let's go for uh, his career, acting career. He joined this company called, uh, acting company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. You know, this company was called the Lord Chamberlain's Men during the reign of Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth I. So during the Elizabethan age, this acting company was called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. And they put on place before uh, Queen Elizabeth, a uh, kind of a uh, Queen's favorite uh, acting company. There were a lot of acting companies. This is one of the famous uh, acting companies because they put on plays for royals to see private uh, private plays. So the, here is a picture for you uh, where it seems that might be Queen Elizabeth I and uh, she might be enjoying, she might, uh, might be enjoy uh, watching this uh, play put on by Shakespeare's company. And after the death of Queen Elizabeth I, James I, you know, uh, Jacobian age, so during that period, the same company was called the King's Men, 1603. It was renamed. So Shakespeare worked, we can say, in the acting company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men or the King's Men. Next, the theater. Uh, we know the Globe Theater. It was built, uh, they started building the company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men. Uh, the old one was out. So they started building this one with the timber from the old one, 1599. And the theater was built by the actors for actors. You know, the actors um, uh, in the company and they invested money, including Shakespeare. Uh, he had a share and a lot of other players. And they built this one. And this is also called, you know, Shakespeare uh, was, uh, Shakespeare referred to this uh, theater, the Globe Theater, this wooden O, the shape. The shape of the theater, O shape, in Henry V. But unfortunately, uh, it was uh, destroyed by fire in uh, 1613 when there was a scene in uh, Henry VIII, uh, original name, All is True. And there was this cannon scene, uh, it was supposed to fire, and, uh, and the roof caught fire and it was uh, destroyed. But anyway, it was rebuilt in uh, the following year, uh, 1614. And Shakespeare share, when we talk about uh, you know, uh, Shakespeare's share in the sense, I told you before, uh, it was a jack of all trade as an actor, a playwright, and he also uh, held some shares in this playhouse. So here is a description uh, from Bryson, Bryson's book. So the land was bought in uh, 1599. And the owners, the you know, the major shareholders, you have uh, Burbage, Cuthbert, 
and richard burbage one of the famous actors of all time at the time i mean all time in the sense uh, elizabethan one of the famous elizabethan actors richard burbage so they they owned a lot of shares then the troop the members of the company shakespeare heminges you have to remember heminges uh, we will discuss him later then augustine uh, philips then thomas pope then again remember this guy uh, will kemp okay they had they were all investors they also had a lot of shares the modern day this is the modern day globe it is called shakespeare's globe uh, rebuild the modern construction uh, they opened in 1997 so hope one day uh, uh, we could go to england maybe we can uh, we could visit this place uh, in a kind of an ideal dream so let's see uh, if we could go there we should visit uh, shakespeare's globe a dream right okay uh, shakespearean actors i have to mention a few shakespearean actors because as a group as a group you know they they rocked the entire age uh, you know the elizabethan age so i told you you have the you have this great actor richard burbage he excelled in tragedy most of the time he played shakespeare's uh, tragic roles you know uh, tragic characters hamlet othello king lear macbeth richard 3 henry 5 romeo the top protagonists so he is known for tragedy whereas uh, they are, on the other hand we have william kemp or will kemp uh, it's like our uh, tamil vadivel uh, it's like vadivel good at comedy and there were references in hamlet uh, uh, you know there is a reference or a, a kind of an allusion uh, ham you know if you know the play hamlet uh, he puts on a play within a play the most trap and he also gives some instructions to the players who is going to act in that play so hamlet says you know stick to your lines because there was this uh, interesting thing that william kemp or will kemp like vadivelu sometimes he doesn't stick to lines sometimes the moment he goes to the stage he becomes a different being and sometimes he goes beyond the lines given to him and people enjoy it so he was allowed to do that maybe uh, shakespeare was referring to will kemp in hamlet saying please stick to your line william kemp okay so that might be the line and william kemp was good at uh, comedy as uh, richard burbage was good at tragedy he played doc berry uh, doc berry sorry uh, much ado about nothing then peter in uh, romeo and juliet and he was believed to have played falstaff one of the most famous uh, comic character in shakespeare's plays he appears in a lot of plays uh, refer to him even uh, um, in your prescribed text he appears so you have a uh, prescribed a text so uh, check out font stuff uh, he appears in uh, henry 4 then you have bottom in uh, one of his famous uh, uh, comedy a uh, midsummer night's dream okay we go to the next one shakespeare's obra referring to the overall works of uh, shakespeare we all know there is but let's say ideally uh, you know people agree on this numbers Shakespeare wrote thirty-seven plays. I mean, authorized. Uh, we believe that Shakespeare wrote thirty-seven plays. There are a lot of disputes, some contention, but we will discuss that later. Okay, we will agree on thirty-seven plays, one fifty-four sonnets, two epics, Venus and Adonis on the one hand, and Lucrezia on the other. Then we have one narrative poem, a lover's complaint. Then one allegorical poem, the Phoenix and the Turtle. okay these are acknowledged then we have a collection of 20 poems called the passionate pilgrim uh, published by william jacket uh, 1599 uh, it was attributed to shakespeare we may not know it was originally written by shakespeare but shakespeare might have done that you know at that time poetry was profitable you should remember that because there was this tradition if you write a play as a playwright the plays written by you belong to the theater the theater company the plays do not belong to the playwright once the play was written the script or the plays belong to the theater so shakespeare 
so if he wanted money and uh, there was a time there was a plague and the theaters were closed shakespeare went for uh, poetry he wrote poems so he might have published poems to earn some money okay we don't know and besides all these things uh, he might have collaborated with uh, another playwright john fletcher he might have written uh, two noble kingsmen so this is kind of his opera no? uh, uh, kind of french work oral works you know all the works written by uh, shakespeare right. so next um, we'll go for some classification or some uh, you know how what how people look at shakespeare's plays some description of uh, his plays hamlet without any dispute is considered shakespeare's longest play fire play you know uh, when i was teaching this play hamlet university of madras department of english yes it was the longest play five act it takes a lot of time the entire semester is not enough uh, to teach this entire play uh, i was able to finish the generally uh, you know three acts comfortably then fourth and fourth and fifth act generally we go for our presentations we ask the students to come up with the presentations so generally uh, you know once we finish three acts uh, they might be in a position to work out on their own so that's what we do for hamlet entire semester is not enough to teach this uh, beautiful play called the hamlet then we have uh, some dispute as to the shortest play but anyway uh, majority say okay the comedy of errors where we have uh, uh, you know similar looking i mean people two two sets so you have the protagonist they look similar and their own servants they look similar two twins in this play so based on mistaken identity one of the sources for comedy the comedy of errors which is considered the shortest play but when it comes to tragedy the shortest tragedy we have macbeth so sometimes we don't know what is the shortest play maybe let's say the shortest uh, comedy or the entire one uh, plays of all the plays uh, 37 we have the comedy parrots when it comes to tragedy alone we have uh, macbeth and we also have the short uh, uh, kind of an abbreviation right uh, home h o l m you might have heard you know h o l m hamlet othello lear and macbeth home so that's there uh, maybe this is the shortest uh, tragedy uh, macbeth next this play is often uh, referred to as the bards play of course uh, now whenever we pronounce this word odd it sounds odd to tamil ears the bard here uh, the bard you are thinking of i am thinking of is not associated with this bard this bard is a bard in i mean a poet okay a poet good poet it's not something else is a bard i mean the poet so the bards play refers to macbeth and generally they don't say macbeth because that is this a tradition people believe that uttering this name very name of the play is actually a curse they were invoking a curse an ancient curse uh, because if you look at the production of this play all its productions were plagued with accidents blood death disasters even the even films so generally they don't refer to the play macbeth no that's a curse oh my god rinse your mouth out now why go no but the name of the play therefore is to be uttered you know in a kind of an indirect way the scottish play the bards play and it's also prescribed to you the play is prescribed to you uh, one of the detailed plays that you should uh, read along with the tempest so you have the one of the famous soliloquies uh, Uh, when we think of san lucas we have a hamlet to be or not to be then we have tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow sound and fury right life is a tale told by an idiot you know signifying nothing full of sound and fury so tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow macbeth's famous soliloquy showing his uh, disputed mind a kind of a troubled mind okay. so next we have something called problem plays see these problems we plays were different from the problem plays we discussed earlier in the sense when we discussed 
modern drama under unit 8 modern drama we discussed problem plays problem plays that refers to plays addressing social problems so when we say problem plays in the modern context modern drama they refer to you know plays addressing social issues so we have uh, the norwegian playwright hendrik ibsen addressing you know um, the role or the status of women at that time so you have a, a doll's house right a, a woman a wife a mother she borrowed money for her husband to recover you now for her husband's help and finally she realized oh my god he was so selfish and she shut the door to his face and she left the home so that was radical at that time and that's a social problem it was addressed by the norwegian playwright hendrik ibsen i b s e n hendrik ibsen and we have a follower in ireland we have george bernard shaw so george bernard shaw put on lot of plays addressing social issues all right for instance you have a chocolate cream soldier i mean a soldier who wants who was looking for food rather than bullets because he had wrong bullets Homes and the man. So these plays are problem plays. Modern drama, modern drama, problem plays. These plays were different. But when it comes to Shakespeare, problem plays. These problem plays were different. The problem here is that how to classify these works. Tough classification. You can't simply say it's based on history or a comedy or a romance or a tragedy. There is no clear cut description. So that's why. these plays were called problem plays in terms of its theme and form okay the term was coined by f s bos in shakespeare and his uh, predecessors 1896 uh, initially he said problem plays referring to three plays of shakespeare all is well that ends well then measure for measure which is prescribed to you which means a tit for tat palit to palit measure for measure right so here a nun a sister has to save the brother suskin who was supposed to be executed for impregnating her, his uh, betrothed right so again at the end of the play there is a kind of uh, the duke coming back and proposing to this nun so kind of an open ending we may not know, know what's going to happen next okay then bos who coined this term also included uh, hamlet tough to classify because there were a lot of hamlets before this play hamlet even uh, thomas kidd was said to have uh, put on a play called the hamlet so there were original hamlets so maybe how to classify this hamlet is a tough job next we have uh, for the first time tetralogy four a set of four works or four plays tetra four so we have uh, henry 6 part 1 henry 6 part 2 henry 6 Uh, part three, then Richard three, okay, one of the famous plays, Richard three. So you have first tetralogy. So this is another classification of Shakespeare's uh, plays. Then we have another term, Henriet, referring to the second tetralogy. Another four, uh, a group of four plays by Shakespeare. The term was popularized by Alvin Kernan in his uh, article, The Henriet, Shakespeare's major history plays. So you, you now you have a history plays, Richard two. Henry Fourth Part One. I think that's prescribed for you. Henry Fourth Part uh, Two. Then Henry Five. So these four plays are grouped under uh, Henry Eight. Okay. So there are a lot of classification when it comes to Shakespeare's works, uh, especially the Tessalon. Then we have romances. Uh, the Tempest that is prescribed again uh, for you. Then the Winter's Tale. Then Cymbeline. Then uh, Pericles. a uh, symbol in there is a story that um, uh, the victorian poet uh, tennyson on his deathbed he was reading and he was holding that play on his deathbed uh, even after his death that's a interesting story maybe you can check out uh, tennyson and shakespeare's uh, uh, plays i guess tennyson okay. next uh, roman plays yes major source uh, shakespeare might have had a, a little grammar of uh, latin and greek but he was an englishman 
he read translation the other day we also discussed the translation or the translations of the bible and the contribution to the english language by uh, the translators of the bible shakespeare spencer milton uh, that's uh, we discussed one day so shakespeare might have mastered you know history and all the other things through english because the it was a renaissance the period was a renaissance people were translating a lot of things into english and here is a translation by thomas and north in 1579 plutarch's parallel lives it has a lot of lives you know uh, emperors kings and queens dukes a lot of lives and shakespeare based uh, his roman plays on this famous work plutarch's parallel lives plutarch's lives okay so you have uh, coriolanus which is considered shakespeare's masterpiece when it comes to you know overall uh, along with the hamlet coriolanus uh, lenus is considered as masterpiece then you have julius caesar it a brute you to british so you have uh, um, an ambitious man killed by an ideal man uh, brutus then you have a cunning fellow antony then you have antony and cleopatra another tragedy where cleopatra chooses to die by pressing uh, a snake to her uh, breast then you have a cruel a senecan tragedy full of blood uh, titus uh, antonicus uh, which is considered the violent the most violent uh, play written by uh, shakespeare no longer read by many but it's considered uh, one of the uh, uh, violent plays by shakespeare then we have lost the plays uh, i mean we no longer have the script of these plays uh, but we believe that shakespeare wrote these plays cardinio people are in, uh, people still in search of this play and some have uh, come up with a script some have worked out the play i mean uh, script then you have love's labors one not lost this time one and there was this thing uh, interesting thing that the play cardinio actually was attrib attributed to shakespeare and uh, fletcher and its plot might be based on an episode in uh, the spanish uh, novelist cervantes don quixote that's the english pronunciation or the spanish pronunciation don quixote so which is considered the first modern novel Cervantes Don Quixote is considered the first modern novel in Europe and there are a lot of parallels between Shakespeare and Cervantes you know both were contemporaries and you know, both were uh, born uh, sometimes in the same year people say uh, 23rd April uh, 1564 Cervantes in Spain Shakespeare in England and both created uh, mad men one hamlet on one side you have uh, wizard on the other side two man mad people who imagined a lot and they changed the world you know imagination so on the one side you have a hamlet uh, struggling to take revenge on the other side you have wizard struggling to understand reality because uh, wizard he reads a lot of novels romances adventures so he wants to have an adventure of his own then he goes out and the reality is different which is considered the first modern novel because modern in the sense for the first time a common man is the hero not some uh, arthurian legend some red cross knight as in spencer or something someone else or uh, iliad or odyssey achilles or odysseus no is it is a simple man who wants to you know want to see what he has gone through in the books in his books so from his journey starts from his library and the entire book okay. then uh, another source for cardinio i mean how to go to cardinio so louis theobald's play double falsehood he said that he uh, he he was actually putting on this play based on shakespeare's uh, cardinio that was his claim or the distressed lovers you know that's subtitle so we may not know these are uh, last plays and the first one cardinio is a famous play um, people have been trying to reach out to this play or recover this play right. 
Apocrypha refers to you know the plays attributed to Shakespeare or the plays he collaborated uh, on with others. So these are some of the plays. There are a lot of plays attributed to Shakespeare. We may not know, not convincing evidence that Shakespeare really wrote all these plays. But uh, here we go. The London Prodigal, uh, Thomas Lord Cromwell, Sir John Oldcastle, The Puritan Widow, A Yorkshire Tragedy, uh, Lorraine, uh, Lockrine, uh, Misidorus, Arden of uh, Faversha, which is considered, you know, we talk about that play often, Arden of uh, Faversha, then so on. The list goes on and on. But we do not have enough evidence that these plays were oh, no, actually written by Shakespeare. We don't know. So these uh, are termed apocrypha or apocryphal plays in the sense uh, we don't know the real story. Next, we are coming to an important thing. So these are some of the classifications of, classification of Shakespeare's plays. Now let's go for the compilation. After the death of Shakespeare in 1616, his friends and fellow actors and uh, you know one, ones who worked with him in The King's Men, I mean, Lord Chamberlain's. Right? So the company they, you have, I told you, remember, Heminges, John Heminges and another fellow, uh, Henry Condon. They put together, you know, Shakespeare's plays. But this collection had only, uh, you know, you should remember, uh, only 36 plays. Uh, Pericles was not included. Generally, we agree upon uh, this figure, 37 plays. Shakespeare wrote 37 plays. But the first collection of Shakespeare's plays had only 36 plays. Pericles was not included. And it was published in uh, 1623. It's called the first folio. So generally, these are question setters the favorite. Generally, they ask a lot of questions from uh, these things. The, when was the first folio published? The second folio is actually the reversal, 1632. Then the third folio, fourth folio. And by the way, what is a folio? Folio in Latin, folium means a leaf. It's a kind of a metaphor. A book, you know, a sheet, a paper, a sheet of paper, a piece of paper in a book called a leaf, right? So that's why we say leaflet, booklet. So it's called a leaf. So uh, leaves. So at that time, they have a printer's, you know, sheet of paper. If you just, you know, fold it uh, only once, the result would be only two leaves, you know, a lengthy paper, kind of a, not A4, you know, more than that, a bigger one. So you have two leaves in the size, four pages, one, two, three, four sides. So you have two leaves. So the size is bigger and it is considered a quality one, considered very, and it's very expensive to come up with a folio edition. So in order to pay a tribute to Shakespeare, uh, Heminges and Condell, they came up with a folio, which is very expensive to come up with. And they compiled it, they edited it, and they were considered the first editors of Shakespeare's works, 1623. But there were some quartos here too, not more expensive, not considered prestigious. Here you have to fold that sheet twice. So you will have uh, four leaves, eight pages which is not so expensive. Uh, the sheet is uh, kind of a yellowish dark, um, not very prestigious, but affordable. You can buy quartos. So this is the difference between folio and quartos. Check out uh, other folios, the second folio and third folio or fourth folio. Here, I mean collections of Shakespeare's plays and also quartos. There were also fake editions, like a, a, you know plagiarist words or uh, pirated versions. Even now, when a book becomes a success, you know, people plagiarize. Uh, people come up with the pirated versions. Even in, when it comes to coaching institutions, one coaching institution come up with a material and people steal. And that's a natural one. You know, uh, genius and uh, a good institution is always imitated. Then we go for the portraits of an artist. We have been looking at uh, when Shakespeare was born, the father, the mother, and wife, children, uh, acting career, all the other things. Now let's who, you know, how, how does he look? You know, how does he look? So portraits of an artist. So we have two famous portraits. Uh, one is an engraving, whether it's not a portrait. Uh, Dorset, I mean, now the first folio 
it came up with this engraving by this artist t r o e s h h y u t roshet so he engraved shakespeare's uh, the face so this is the famous one when we think of shakespeare we think of this engraving it, it was actually published in the first folio 1623 and the artist name of the artist so it is named after the artist so the dorset engraving then there was this family called the shandos uh, family they had a portrait might have been sketched between uh, 1600 and 1610 we don't know there were a lot of disputes and it was recovered later and people thought that was this was shakespeare remember i told you uh, we also looked at another picture uh, mermaid tavern where shakespeare was sitting with this kind of a costume uh, a suit and if you look at this um, you know painting very closely um, i read bill bryson he also interviewed a lot of people and this is the interpretation for this particular uh, portrait if you look at him he was actually wearing a kind of an ear ring right a kind of a bohemian statement a theater artist then lips are rosy and kind of a makeup and look at his beard kind of a french uh, no not english so english then the cloth i mean the suit black maybe one interpretation is that maybe he sat for this portrait after the makeup you know theater artist as a theater artist he might have played a role and he came out of that role uh, maybe um, uh, he was captured you know as a an actor you know as an actor he was wearing that makeup we don't know that one interpretation that's makeup uh, he went for lipsticks or rosy cheeks and lips and this uh, uh, earring and another interpretation is very quite interesting at that time black clothes black clothes were expensive why they needed dye you know in order to dye the dye black they had to go for a lot of uh, material so wearing black i mean dye the you know, dye cloth was expensive and he was making a statement and he was rich and uh, even in that picture mermaid tavern he looks different you know solo guy so maybe that uh, that is a kind of a style statement or a rich statement so these are the two portraits we have of this artist next we'll go for the editors so one editor you have this heminges and condell but in the 18th century uh, nicholas rowe remember nicholas rowe one who came up with that story that shakespeare uh, uh, was caught poaching deer and to escape punishment he ran away to he came to london okay so that the story was given by nicholas rowe uh, who is considered the first modern editor of the bards works uh, 1709 edition six volumes which is considered the first illustrated edition uh, the important thing is this guy changed the way shakespeare's works are uh, edited he came up with this uh, frontispiece engraving for each play for each play he came up with a kind of a kind of an engraving uh, thematically based then he divided plays into scenes so shakespeare just wrote you know it went on and on so he divided them into scenes or sometimes into acts so we can't say five act four act so that were actually by the editors then entrance and exit he introduced that one then he normalized the spelling so spelling reform during the 18th century england then we have this a uh, dramatic person list of characters that was actually his idea nicholas rose's idea so now we have all these features in the modern edition and this was done by the first modern editor uh, nicholas rose then we have the famous uh, dispute when it comes to shakespeare's uh, edition of uh, edition of shakespeare uh, alexander pope 1725 six volumes then uh, louis theobald 1733 interesting these people fought uh, why i tell you why so theobald came up with this um, uh, work on uh, after the publication of after the publication of pope's uh, edition of shakespeare 1725 and 1726 he came up with this work shakespeare restored why restored 
because Shakespeare was defiled by Pope. That was his accusation. Look at the screen here. Shakespeare restored are a specimen of the many errors as well as committed as unamended by Mr. Pope. So Theobald wrote this book accusing Pope, Mr. Pope, you made a lot of errors in your edition. You actually introduced a lot of errors. So Theobald pointed out those mistakes. He also gave suggestions. This irritated Pope. So he was irritated to the core. So he was, he, you know, he took pride in editing Shakespeare's work. And here is a guy, Louis Theobald, accusing him of uh, uh, stupidity and uh, committing errors. Then he, ha he had to save his face, you know, famous point, Alexander Pope. So he came up with uh, the Danciate, the mock epic, a kind of a mock heroic poem, the Danciate, a kind of an uh, ass, donkey. Actually, Theobald was the one who kicked uh, Alexander Pope's ass, I mean, uh, donkey. As he refers to donkey. So he was the one who kicked his ass. But in order to take revenge, uh, Alexander Pope portrayed Theobald as donkey, uh, the king of you know, dull, you know, uh, fools in the Danciate. Okay. But ironically, when El Alexander Pope went for the next edition, revision, he actually carried out the suggestion given, given by Theobald. That is the irony. You know, that's where you have, if you understand this conflict, I hope hereafter when you read that, you know, the Danciad by Pope, you, you know the, the background story, okay, the backstory. Next, we'll go for another edition, boundarizing Shakespeare. What happened? So here is a guy, a brother and sister, like um, we have uh, Lamb, Charles Lamb and sister. So here, here you have a brother and sister uh, pair an English doctor, Thomas Bowler, and his sister, Harriet. This was Harriet's idea. Okay, Harriet. She came up with this idea for young readers, bringing uh, Shakespeare to young readers, young girls and boys and family. And uh, at that time, uh, Shakespeare played to the gallery, unlike uh, Sachin Tendulkar. He played to the gallery in the sense uh, to please the crowd. He included everything, all the phrases, vulgar comedy, uh, all the other things, uh, you know, uh, even in when you read Hamlet, there are a lot of phrases which you can't explain explicitly. So these people, the bowlers, they edited the play. E edited in the sense they removed a lot of uh, uh, passages which they considered inappropriate for young audience or offensive uh, to proper uh, family audience, right? And uh, after a period of time, this kind of an editing, you know, removing uh, objectionable uh, passages from a work is called, uh, you know, we have a verb, boulderize. So this verb is, uh, you know, it's a kind of an eponymous word, E-P-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, eponymous, E-P-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, a eponymous word or eponymous words uh, refer to words derived from a proper name proper name, you know, because it's a proper name, Thomas Bowdler. So we have a name derived from, I mean, a verb derived from a proper name. So it's an eponymous word. So we move from editing to the death of uh, Shakespeare, 23rd April, 1616. And the year 2016 was celebrated throughout the world, which marked the 400th anniversary of uh, Shakespeare's death, 1564, 1616. But remember, I told you, we have his Spanish contemporary, Cervantes, who came up with, like Hamlet, he came up with uh, uh, Tom Quisart, another madman. So both um, died in the same year or born in the same uh, date, we don't know, but died in the same year. So the same year, his death anniversary was also celebrated, 400 uh, death anniversary of uh, Cervantes. So we have two genius here. So with this, we are almost concluding the first part of today's lecture, Shakespeare, a biography. And one of my uh, uh, references is Bill Bryson's Shakespeare. Why I went for this book, very approachable book. He read a, you know, Bill Bryson is known for 
this kind of writing he reads a lot of lot of a great deal of books i don't know it's the kind of a mind that digests everything and comes up with a beautiful uh you know dessert which we can eat and enjoy eating so here is a book if you are interested in uh, reading about shakespeare an approachable one and easy to buy you know uh, it's not uh, it's not very costly bill bryson's uh, shakespeare i enjoyed reading this book so this is one of a major references there are i refer a lot of books this is but this i have to tell you so this my one of my references i have input a lot of passages uh, from this book next if you are interested in reading shakespeare's biography uh, go for uh, frank kermont the age of shakespeare it's not just about shakespeare but the entire age you will get to know about uh, you know shakespeare in the elizabethan time now the plays how they were put on uh, the timing the script uh, everything okay then you so that you can place shakespeare in the context next one a recent work uh, james uh, shapiro s h a p i r o contested will look at the word play the title contested will will william shakespeare it's a word play beautiful word play who wrote shakespeare i mean as if uh, shakespeare uh, is, is a kind of a metonymy uh, the whole for the part uh, uh, referring to the author uh, for the entire work who wrote shakespeare's work i mean the place so who wrote shakespeare then you have this uh, famous biographer english biographer peter ackroyd shakespeare and look at the subtitle i was um, thinking about this subtitle i mean the definite article the biography it says i mean the biography i mean it's supposed to be a biography one of the versions but it's a claim uh, maybe because peter ackroyd is known for writing biographies just to check out um, uh, peter ackroyd um, he wrote a biography of dickens uh, i think chaucer <coughs> lot of biographies the entire life even london he wrote a biography of london that's there on the screen okay yes you have you have a question if you have a question you can ask or or shall i move on okay i am moving on uh, please put it on mute okay so we are going to the next part before that we also have to discuss anna hathaway okay see people have been discussing the biography of shakespeare but the, but people forget his wife anna hathaway so the feminist they thought they should recover anna hathaway's biography it was a tough challenge right you know writing an imagined biography of shakespeare at least you know one editor came up with a story that shakespeare uh, stole dears dear so in an attempt a beautiful attempt by uh, jemen grab g r e r shakespeare's wife so this is the name of the book it's a kind of um, imagined biography whatever evidence we have she came up with this biography and there are a lot of interesting things which will also help you understand shakespeare's life see remember we have this lost years what happened after the birth of the twins and his arrival in london then here is an interesting observation by germaine greer she says it was actually anne hathaway the wife who sent her boy husband to seek his fortune in london because little boy 18 years old he married this woman elderly woman and now at that time they had children three and this guy has been roaming around maybe or might be and killing you know uh, hunting hunting down animals dear so maybe the wife said it's time he went to uh, london and earn some money for this family go go idiot boy uh, you know maybe the husband the boy husband might have gone to uh, london because of this reason so she is filling out the gap the last years so this is another story uh, better than a nicholas rose story right and she also i mean the writer there she also suggests and hathaway might have sponsored 
for the publication of the first folio, which I told you very expensive coming out with the folio edition, 1623. And Anne Hathaway inherited Shakespeare's you know, wealth and rights uh, maybe. And she might have contributed some money and the papers to for this publication because which is considered expensive. So she might be behind the publication. So kind of uh, uh, suggesting that we read Shakespeare because of Anne Hathaway. So that is a suggestion that Shakespeare was alive today. Uh, Shakespeare is still alive today because of Anne Hathaway. If she hadn't sponsored, if she hadn't uh, you know, paid some money towards this publication, we might, never, might not have the publication of all his plays. So that's a suggestion. So that's an important book, uh, Shakespeare's Wife. And recent publication, last year we had this book, a sensation, Hamnet. It's a novel by uh, Maggie O'Farrell, which won uh, 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction, which was earlier called Orange Prize. Uh, then renamed it Women's Prize for Fiction. 2020, this is the winner, one of the sensational works in recent times, especially during this uh, pandemic. Because, you know, uh, uh, that's the book, uh, you know, look at the title, Hamnet. It talks about uh, the son and also Hamlet and the wife, Ennis. And now let's talk about another uh, poem, I mean, another work by Carol Ann Daffy, the Scottish writer. She came up with this uh, dramatic monologues. The entire collection, the world's wife, like Shakespeare's wife, the entire collection is all filled with dramatic monologues. Dramatic monologues by Anna Hathaway, dramatic monologues by Freud's wife, by Aesop's wife, Sisyphus' wife, a lot of wives. They are, they are telling their, their own point of view. So here is uh, Anna Hathaway. Um, Anna Hathaway's uh, dramatic monologue. Uh, you might be knowing uh, when Shakespeare wrote his will, in his will, um, he gave his, uh, this, is the, this is what he wrote. I give unto my wife my second best bed with the furniture, referring to the bed clocks. Uh, how to you know, understand this, we don't know. The context, some say Shakespeare uh, was insulting Anna Hathaway by um, you know, bequeathing only the second best bed to uh, his wife. But there were arguments that the second best bed to bed refers to their marital bed. The first bed, best bed actually reserved for the guests. So maybe Shakespeare was uh, uh, kind of remembering their romance as a young husband to an uh, elderly woman. We don't know. There are uh, different interpretations. One interpretation, he was a demeaning Anna Hathaway by bequeathing this second best bed. Or maybe he's uh, remembering their romance. We don't know, right? But anyway, Carol Ann Daffy's poem, Anna Hathaway, the dramatic monologue, uh, is going for another interpretation that is kind of a demeaning one. So this is the poem. Uh, I'm a few lines from the poem. My living, laughing love. So maybe laughing love in the sense Shakespeare was laughing at, mocking at uh, Anna Hathaway. But you should also remember uh, she inherited some wealth after Shakespeare's death. I hold him in the casket of my widow's head as he held me upon that next best bed. So she is kind of mocking him. See, we, when you remember, you know, when you think of me, you thought only the second best bed, not anything else for me. So now she is thinking of him uh, uh, in a kind of a metaphor, the casket of. I told you uh, in my earlier class that you can uh, create metaphors using of, the casket of the face of the sun. Uh, so that's one way of creating metaphors using off, off. So the casket of my widow's head, okay? So now Shakespeare is buried in her mind, the casket of my widow's head, okay? So with this, we are moving to, I mean, kind of an interlude before we go to Shakespeare's sonnets. So kind of a brief introduction to this famous form, a kind of a fixed form, fixed in the sense we have a certain tradition to it. 
so this is just an introduction. We are not going in detail, but this introduction is essential to understand uh, Shakespearean sonnets. Okay, so we are moving from one section, Shakespeare's uh, biography, to Shakespeare. I mean, sonnet, or the form. Okay, the word sonnet comes from sonto, Italian word, which means a little song. And we have the fathers of the English sonnet, Thomas Wyatt and Earl of Surrey, who are uh, whose poems were prescribed to you. I think five poems were prescribed to you, two by Wyatt and three by Surrey. You can watch the video on uh, the video on the YouTube on uh, syllabus decoder by Professor Academy. So they have the sonnet form, Italian sonnet that was introduced into English by Thomas Wyatt, but Earl of Surrey, he changed a few things. He actually came up with this a typical in English sonnet, in the sense, three quadrants. Four lines, four lines, four lines. Sorry, four lines, four lines, four lines. Then the concluding couplet, two lines. And the rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. So this is a typical English sonnet form. This was introduced by Earl of Surrey. But the sonnet form in general was introduced by uh, Thomas Wilde. So we should be clear about that. And the sonnet form introduced by Earl of Surrey was exploited by Shakespeare to the core. Love sonnets, 154 sonnets. So we call that form Shakespearean sonnets. And of course, we have a 14 lines. Sonnet means 14 lines. So here is a major classification or major types. One, Italian or Petrarchan, no, named after uh, Petrarch, uh, the point, Italian poet. Italian or Petrarchan sonnet. Um, so you have two divisions, 14 lines, eight plus six octave, sestet. And for octave, we have the rhyme scheme or rhyming, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And for sestet, six lines, C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, C, D, C. English introduced by Surrey, Earl of Surrey, Shakespearean sonnet. So three quatrains and a concluding couplet. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. See, remember all these um, rhyme schemes. Questions may come from these rhyme schemes, okay? Then Spencerian sonnet by Edmund Spencer. It's a kind of uh, variant, a kind of a deviation uh, from this established one. Thing is, the structure is the same, four quatrains and a couplet, but he went for connecting rhymes. See, look at Shakespearean sonnet, you have A, B, A, B, but the second quatrain, he goes for different uh, rhyme. Whereas look at uh, Spencer's one, A, B, A, B, first quatrain, four lines. Second quatrain, it's a connector to the first quatrain in terms of the rhyme, B. B, C, B, C, then third quarter and again connected, C, D, C, D. The, third, no, for, the last is different. So that's why it's different from uh, Shakespearean sonnet or uh, the typical English sonnet. So we call it Spencerian sonnet. Then there is this uh, uh, important term called Walta, uh, which is again an Italian term referring to a turning point, a turning point in terms of theme or mood of the sonnet. Generally, when you a sonnet, the theme of sonnet is love, love sonnets. Typically, this form is for love. Okay. So in the Italian sonnet, there is a change in the argument or mood of a sonnet. It occurs uh, between the octave, you know, the first eight line and the beginning of the end of this octave and the beginning of the system. So at the ninth line. But in the English sonnet, it happens before the final couplet. I mean, after the end of three quatrains, the third quatrain, 13th line. Just remember this, we will, I will give an you know, example. I will give an example to this when we discuss uh, Shakespearean sonnets in the next section. So hold your horses. Next one. Next type, Miltonic sonnet. So this is different. You know, it's a type of, or a variant of Petrarchan sonnet, Italian sonnet by Milton. But what did he do? He got rid of Walter. He said, no more Walter. One thing goes on and on. Then he went for this term called enchantment, or it's called a run-on line. What does that mean when it comes to poetry? 
if the thought runs from one line to another line another line to another line without end um, it is different from heroic couplets you know uh, pope and dryden dryden and pope they came up with heroic couplets two line one thought the thought is over within the two lines couplet like um, the tamil poet tiruvalluvar so he is tiruvalluvar is known for kural tirukural two line couplet right one thought or uh, a comparison over so tiruvalluvar is known for that kind of word but this is the different one enchantment the thought runs to the next line in terms of syntax everything changes so petra i mean milton goes for this kind of uh, run on lines next this is different in terms of theme milton is different so now it's not just love it's actually social and he is addressing political issues so you have uh, his uh, one of his sonnets on the late massacre in pyt so it talks about a political problem people were massacred at that point uh, so he wrote that sonnet to address that issue okay so milton's sonnet differs from the earlier ones next is a guy who is uh, also differing from the tradition jim hopkins was a priest a poet whenever i think of uh, jim hopkins i think of uh, stephen dedalus uh, of uh, james joyce a portrait of the artist as an young man or he also comes in uh, 1922 ulysses so he has that uh, epiphanic moment or a kind of a struggle in his mind whether to be a priest or whether to be a poet and he came up with a contracted sonnet in the sense sonnet deals with one theme so we can say sonnet but questionable a typical sonnet should have 14 lines but uh, they call it cutel sonnet you know cutel cut off so we have only a tenet of line tenet of lines so this is a sonnet and here is a rhyme scheme and with a tail you know the last half a line is called a tail and the 10 line we have the rhyme scheme a b c a b c d c b and d b or a b c a b c d b c d c okay and uh, his uh, famous kurtle sonnets pied beauty and peace then let's uh, go for a sonnet cycle or sonnet sequence in the sense based on a theme or a based on a person you have a series of sonnets or a sequence of sonnets of course a famous 154 sonnets uh, shakespeare sonnets earlier we have uh, sydney philip sydney astrophel and stella um, you know when it comes to net exam national eligibility test uh, some questions come from here you know how many sonnets uh, that kind of a question so astrophel and stella 108 sonnets and 11 songs so this is considered the first sonnet cycle or sonnet sequence in english uh, 1580 then you have amarati love again love love sonnets edmund spenser 89 sonnets then we have shakespeare 154 sonnets which we will discuss in the next uh, section then you have uh, john dens holy sonnets uh, in which we have an elegy of his uh, wife then you have words what during the romantic age we have uh, ecstatical sonnets 132 sonnets then we have uh, this uh, dante gabriel rossetti i you know uh, pre raphaelite brotherhood we have a literary moment pre raphaelite brotherhood we will discuss soon that moment the house of life one not one sonnets uh, plus an introductory one then his sister christina rossetti mona inominata 14 sonnets and um, of all the sonnets this title sounds good mona inominata there is some ring to it beautiful then you have uh, elizabeth barrett browning's love sonnets sonnets from the portuguese 44 sonnets there is actually a story to the title sonnets from the portuguese you might have um, observed this whenever there is a translation there is this uh, definite article the you might have noticed in translations translated from the tamil translated from the malayalam translated from the hindi translated from the spanish the french i have been wondering why this article the even once i was curious uh, i wrote uh, so mr upendra of uh, you know this hindu that uh, the hindu newspaper there was this column no your english 
uh, i was not sure i really got the answer from him but anyway i understood it actually means it's actually the here it is referred to the original i mean sonnets from the spanish original so it so the title says the sonnets were translated works not original uh, sonnets from the portuguese original so similar way when we say the french it means this is an english translation from the french original from the spanish original so generally they they cut off the original the word original so we have the tamil the i mean because we have this curious notion that uh, when we say the tamil that refers to the tamil people or this french people or the hindi people so here it refers to the original text okay so finally i understood why this uh, you know curious article the you know before this uh, uh, place a uh, country okay there is a story to it uh, sonnets from the portuguese as you know elizabeth barrett browning and robert browning they were in love with each other and of course elizabeth barrett browning's father shut her in and uh, she wanted to speak to our uh, hero so heroine as um, she came up with this uh, collection uh, sonnets from the portuguese 44 sonnets love sonnets so as if she were telling the world okay uh, these were kind of a translations so from the portuguese but there is an allusion that actually the portuguese is actually a nickname or kind of a pet name given by robert browning to elizabeth barrett browning my portuguese they they like a portuguese uh, writer or portuguese poem so elizabeth barrett browning was addressed by uh, robert browning as uh, referred to as uh, the portuguese my portuguese so now she is uh, writing she is a kind of a love letter a series of letters sonnets from the portuguese so she says hey, browning i am writing this for you for the outer world these are the translations but this is from me understand this is from me the portuguese your portuguese okay a beautiful title but we are going to the next one okay so end of uh, i mean the last section of uh, today's class shakespearean sonnets so in the first section we looked at uh, uh, a brief introduction to shakespeare's biography second section a brief introduction to the sonnet form third section shakespearean sonnets let's understand what's it okay shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets and typical pattern three quatrains and a couplet and the rhyme scheme a b a b c d c d e f e f g g see there is a tradition when it comes to you know categorizing uh this 154 sonnets there are a lot of characters in shakespeare's uh, sonnets so that's why it's still famous uh, first one to 126 sonnets they are addressed to, to this uh, kind of an um, uh kind of an ideal one the fair youth so what happens in this series of sonnets the series of sonnets are addressed to the fair youth and the persona or the speaker or the poet requests the fair youth to get married fair youth you are wasting your youth so please get married and procreate so that your procreation your children will you know your children will carry forward your beauty so please get married do not waste away your youth so these sonnets are addressed to the fair youth then there is this dark lady and there are competitions or the kind of a rivalry uh, romantic rivalry for this dark lady and there are disputes who this dark lady is you know something to do with shakespeare's life or something else we don't know so that is from 127 to 152 and the last two sonnets 153 154 uh, describes describe the power of cupid manmadan right so that is cupid so this is a general classification or division of uh, 154 sonnets and there is this curiosity still kind of a mystery to solve who is mr wh in the sense when shakespeare sonnets were published i mean first edition you should remember uh, 1623 the first folio of shakespeare's uh, plays here shakespeare sonnets the first edition 16 not 9 printed by a pirate i mean uh, 
one who is known for a kind of a smuggler um, you know underworld publication thomas thorpe t h o r b e thomas thorpe so he came out with this publication we may not know whether shakespeare gave his script all the poems to this guy asked him to publish and share the profit or thomas thorpe uh, illegally published this collection so number one the dispute starts see we started this class with the disputes with his name date of uh, date of birth everything so similar way we don't know and this collection was dedicated to mr w h we don't know who this w h was or who this w h was this who was this w h uh, so this is the dedication to the online bigotter of these ensuing sonnets so someone inspired this sonnets so shakespeare wrote this dedication if shakespeare wrote this dedication who is who was this w h the mysterious one mr w h all happiness and all that eternity promised by our ever living poet wished the well wishing adventurer in setting forth so maybe it was written by the poet shakespeare to w h or it was written by the you know the piracy you know one who came up with this piracy thomas thorpe himself we don't know there are a lot of disputes as to who this uh, or who this uh, mr w h was there were some uh, answers there are some answers uh, the as to the identity of mr w h maybe and we have to ask a lot of mr w h the real person the historical person and the character the fair youth in the sonnets one and the same we don't know sometimes earl of southampton uh, maybe shakespeare was writing this uh, to get the patronship of this earls so that he uh, they, they can be his uh, patrons and give some money we don't know so henry uh, weasley you know a different pronunciation weasley w r i o t h e s l y it's pronounced weasley so henry weasley then william herbert another earl third earl of pembroke so we don't know that's another mystery to solve okay so let's go for one sonnet uh, the famous sonnet sonnet 116 as i told you before we have this typical pattern three quatrains and a couplet so we have the rhyme scheme if you see a b a b so how to go for this rhyme scheme so look at the words the end, the end rhyme minds finds so first you have to go for a let's see a so we have this minds find so a a because the same rhyme then the next second line love so b remove b then mark then bar c c shaken taken cheeks weeks come to so so this is how we now we mark rhyme scheme then we have proved loved okay gg so this is how we mark rhyme scheme and i told you before volta p o l t a the turn in meaning happens at the end you know uh, end of the quatrains the third quatrain if this be error upon me proved i never you know i never writ nor no man ever loved so that's an hyperbole you know a figure of speech a kind of an exaggeration if someone proves me wrong what i have said i will never i will never write but he has been writing maybe he was not proved wrong or it's a kind of an exaggeration yeah. you know whenever i think of uh, this figure of speech hyperbole h y p e r b o l e hyperbole i think of my niece bargavi my uh, elder brother's daughter uh, we took her to a toy shop and she exclaimed oh my god in my entire life i have never seen these many toys and she was four at that time and for her we thought oh my god entire life she used the phrase ya walkai liye ivlo bommaiga paathadilla na sirikira dei va walke naal vayasu anda avanukku so she said my in my entire life i have never seen these many toys in a single place toy shop then i understood hyperbole so this is exaggeration but uh, maybe that's true in her entire life means only four year uh, a four year old kid okay so here is a poem sonnet 116 uh, a love sonnet it talks about the quality of love so 
this is how the speaker says let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment so if you are true if you are true loves after all the obstacles it will come end in marriage i mean it will begin in marriage but love is not love which alters when it alteration point so if you find the excuse to find another love then that is not love so love should not have excuses love is love you know irrespective of whether the person grows old or not beautiful or has some problem or in terms of appearance or the guy getting bald or the girl getting old don't bother about that so if you are in true love we don't bother about that so so we are not bothered about our bends with the remover remove so even everything removed i mean beauty all the thing we don't go for that oh no it's an ever fixed mark so it's like i know it's like a metaphysical conceit a different comparison ever fixed mark like the mark on the skin as kind of a scar it will never go away it is there forever on the skin that looks on tempest and is never shaken in the sense the relationship has lot of ups and downs sometimes it was shaken it's in a comparison to ship it's a kind of a, uh, is going for that kind of a metaphor yet the relationship even in was rocked there are a lot of tempest in a relationship those tempest cannot sink this ship of love so the ship and and the sailors here the lovers they have the storm it is the storm that guides them a kind of a guiding star to every wandering bark so it's a kind of a synecdoche or a kind of a metonymy so bark refers to the wood so here is referring to ship bark whose worth is unknown although its height be taken then love is not times for so it refers to you know after a period of time they get old uh no no longer beautiful skins are sagging uh, no rosy cheeks all the other things no hair sometimes people go bald uh, men uh, teeth they sh- is gone no all these are gone though rosy lips the cheeks within his uh, uh, bend, bending sickles uh, uh, compass come you know here time is personified as if a, a person kind of a grim reaper who has a sickle you know he actually collects a human soul and we come when he comes for his time compass you know his uh, his compass is ticking even when he comes till the guy comes you know we don't bother about that guy love goes love alters not with this brief hours and weeks but bears it out even to the edge of doom till the day of judgment this love is there so these are some of the qualities it describes and there is a change this this is one entire thing it goes on 12 lines three quarter lines suddenly there is a change a twist or a turn so that we call volta so suddenly there is a change if this be error so he is actually shifting there is a change in the mood if this be error upon me prove i will never write okay so this is one famous sonnet so we are on the verge of finishing this today's class on time so next sonnet uh, 130 this sonnet actually parodies mocks the conventional metaphors used in uh, praising lady loves mane tene pon mane ingra mari in tamil we have all these uh, uh, metaphors similar way uh, in petrarchan or italian sonnet they have this exaggerated comparisons no my lady love is like that moon my, the sun you know that kind of an exaggerated comparisons so here is a mockery so uh, sonnet 130 130 is a parody of uh, the italian sonnet so here is a comparison my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun so the first line itself is a mocking one so he is going for, against the conventions generally they compare the eyes of one's lady love with the sun bright inspiring but he says my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun coral is far more red than her lips red okay her lips are not as red as coral i grant i never saw a goddess go right i have never seen uh, you know sometimes people compare you know uh, uh, his lady love you know the walking kind of a gliding like an angel you know flying on the floor tarayla tavalrudu right my mistress when she walks 
treads on the ground maybe this mr is a bulky one so he is not bothered about her physical features or bodily um, you know features it doesn't bother this uh, uh, you know the speaker like uh, sonnet 116 we are not bothered about the physical appearance so he says and yet by heaven i think my love is rare as rare as she belied with false compare so i am not going for false comparison sometimes i have to go for a false comparison to please her and she also smiles okay so that's love so another love song it's on at 130 so i actually uh, have to come up with some uh, word play here a pair of liars because uh, this sonnet is notorious for its word play pun so there is a pun on the word uh, lie l i e to tell falsehood i mean false statements to make false statements and lie also means to sleep with someone so there is a word play on the word lie i mean to tell lies or to sleep with someone so <laughs> and so i thought okay a pair of liars so another word play so oh love's best habit is in seeming trust so he says one of the quality of love is that you should be able to lie convincingly and and the, when someone i mean the partner say you know tells a lie you should seemingly says you you know you have to seemingly uh, believe in that lie so you take in oh is it so so you have to pretend that you are taken in by that lie so seeming trust and age in love loves not to have years told then therefore so therefore i lie with her and she lie with me so there is a word play you know uh, we tell a lot of lies to please each other that is one meaning another meaning is yes they have um, kind of an union a sexual union so that is also implied so it's kind of this uh, comedy dm theme uh, we discuss in uh, to his coy mistress or uh, john dens uh, you know that is for a novel in john dens flee f l e so that kind of a theme and in our falls by lies another word play we flattered we they are happy that they flatter each other no you look look like a lion oh you look like a rose oh, no no you look like the sun oh you look like you know they praise each other they tell lies and they also lie with each other okay so this is sonnet 138 then we are coming to <coughs> the end of uh, today's class uh, the term negative capability was uh, as we discussed earlier uh, was coined by uh, keats the romantic poet to refer to shakespeare's quality of writing shakespeare is known for this capability that he negate his personality and you can't find his personality in his work like a t s eliot in his uh, essay tradition and the individual talent t s eliot came up with this theory right impersonal theory of art so that is here i am invoking that theory but uh, people go against this negative capability uh, i mean this concept they try to find uh shakespeare's biography here remember hathaway uh remember uh, he was 8 years old i mean enger sorry uh, shakespeare was 8 years enger to and hathaway uh 16 year and you know, 18 year old going 26 year woman elderly woman so the, this is the couplet the last two lines of uh, sonnet 145 i hate from hate away she threw and saved my life saying not you so it's a kind of a courtship someone is courting a woman a girl and she says go away so she always says go away go away i hate you and he says i'm very happy you hate me so you actually you saved my life not saying not you so you didn't choose me so i'm very happy you didn't choose me so that is a kind of an irony so actually there is a longing that he wants to be chosen by uh, sorry chosen by the lady love so i hate from hate away so anna hate away liar lie lie that kind of a word play hate away hate away so she, she threw and saved my life saying not you so this is a, a brazen or a people's uh, i mean different scholars across the globe uh, interpretation sonnet 145 contains this pun on the word uh, hathaway maybe 
Shakespeare wrote this sonnet uh, when he was in Stratford upon Avon. Uh, maybe he was a courting um, Anna Hathaway at that time. Uh, he was hurt by her uh, rejection because of the age difference or the social problem. We may not know. Maybe that's a beautiful interpretation. And we also get this idea that Shakespeare didn't write all these uh, sonnets in a single stretch. It's over a period of time, a collection. So we can understand, you know, uh, uh, you know, throwing this uh, negative capability to the winds. Let's say that Shakespeare, uh, a younger guy, you know, 18 year old boy was not an innocent boy, was a not an innocent boy seduced by an older woman. That was an interpretation came up with a few scholars. Uh, Anna Hathaway seduced uh, a young boy. But this understanding um, is altered when we understand that Shakespeare, the young guy, was actually seduced Anna Hathaway. That, that is also possible or not seduction, it's a kind of love. Um, he tried hard to win her heart, a love story, okay? So um, we are coming to the end of uh, today's lecture on Shakespeare's biography and uh, some, a glimpse of Shakespeare. So epitaph. I mean, what's written on Shakespeare's gravestone? So this is what is written. Uh, Shakespeare was buried in the chancel of uh, Church of uh, Holy Trinity Church. Chancel. So here are four lines. So this is written on uh, Shakespeare's uh, gravestone. So let's go for the modern uh, translation. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear. So it has a metaphysical tone, right? For God's sake, hold your tongue, you know, like John Donne. So that kind of, uh, uh, that's a canonization one. So here, that kind of an opening. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear. And actually, it's in the church. So actually, we can compare the canonization, uh, the, uh, John Donne's canonization opening and this opening. So to dig the dust in close to here. So he's saying, do not disturb me. Next, blessed be the man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves the, my bones. Okay, so do not disturb Shakespeare's bones, but we have been disturbing his biography and his personal life and his works all the time. Maybe it's a kind of an irony. Maybe he wants to be disturbed. Okay, so let's go for the last slide. The span of Avon, the, the sweet span of Avon refers to, the phrase refers to Shakespeare. And there was this belief, uh, a kind of a Greek legend that the soul of poets or God of music, Apollo, it actually passed into a span. That was one belief. And Greek philosopher Pythagoras, he believed, or mathematician, he believed that generally the souls of poets passed into spans. So that's uh, his belief. And Plato claimed that when uh, you know, Socrates was executed, before his execution on the day of his death, he actually heard the song of a swan, right? Even in English, there is a phrase called a swan song. But the belief is that the swan, before it dies, lets out its most beautiful melody of its life. So that's the belief, swan song. So this phrase, uh, the soul of the span of song, we believe this beautiful soul or the point, uh, maybe the soul of this point passed into a span, okay? So with this, we wind up, the, uh, wind up today's class. The class is over. Thank you so much uh, for attending today's uh, lecture. The class is over. Feel free to leave.